So that's the plan. In terms of, I mean, I've got a quick snapshot, I think, of what people want to get out of here, but are there any sort of specific burning questions that anybody wants? You know, I'm here to get an answer to this, or I want to know about that. So anything specific? Because we just throw them out there, I'll make sure I cover them. Just one. Just two from my side. So yeah. the first thing is, being a one-man salesperson, yeah. I find it very difficult to have a repeatable process. Yeah. Yeah. So I find that I'm attacking accounts differently and then questioning myself why I'm why I'm doing it differently. Yeah. 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 Second thing is I haven't got time to upsell. And like there's probably no magic slide that says devote ten percent of your week to upsell, but that's something I need to cover. You know, yeah. so if one license for me is worth quarter of a million quid, the second license might be worth hundred grand. Yeah. It's my easy sale, isn't it? Yeah. Rather than trying to find another customer. Yeah, another. Absolutely. Yeah. So they're they're the kind of things that are keeping me awake at night at the moment. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. I think I think the I think the framework will help with that, and also kind of the core principles we're going to cover will probably help with that as well. So yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that. And, cool. and if I don't, just remind me and say what about this. Yeah. Any any other? Do you, do you go into anything in about? You know your cost of acquiring that customer versus lifetime value, and how do you work all that out? Well, we're, we're gonna we're gonna touch on that, we're, um, and, and I can talk about how you work that out. But it, it's those are two really really important um, metrics, right? Yeah. Customer acquisition cost, customer lifetime value are key, and and the key to getting those things in balance. Obviously, what you want you want a low customer acquisition cost and a high customer lifetime value. The way you achieve that is getting the foundation right. You get the foundation right and the principles, and that is what drives a low customer acquisition cost, high customer long-term value. So we'll talk about how you do that. Now, how you measure it um, depends to a certain extent on how you're acquiring your customers, what, what, what kind of channel you're using, and also um, you know, how you're charging for your products as well. But you know, we can talk about that as we go along if you want to ask a specific question, how would I work this out with Calgary? So, yeah, so yeah, and just for clarity, we're talking about more business customer rather than consumers. For this yeah, yeah. So, so this is the other thing. So, yeah. so, so my business sells velocity. So, so my focus is B two B tech startups. That, that's what I'm with because my background is B two B. But that said, everything we're going to cover today it, it is relevant to B two C. It's very relevant. Uh, it's just that I guess when I put all this together, I, in my head, I, I'm thinking about B two B. Okay, but uh, a lot of you know. In fact, really everything we're going to cover today is going to be B2C related. You might apply it in a slightly different way, but the principles are, are, are really the same. Could be good because my take is B2C is more volume driven, whereas B2B is yeah. not. Yeah, 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 exactly, yeah. I mean, B2B can be volume driven, but yeah, but yeah, yeah. it's all relative, yeah. Okay, uh, that's great. So, um, so yeah, so the, you know, we've got we can how to get to a million in, in annual revenue. Um, and, you know, we, 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 we kind of got to assume that we're, we're trying to do that from a standing start. Um, and, and really, um, the key to getting to a million in, in annual revenue, or, or above and beyond, it is to get a working model. If you, if you get the model right, um, that's what enables you to systemize it and automate it. Okay, so it's, this is why it's so important to get the strategy piece right. Because the strategy informs the model and the model is the thing that you can scale, you can automate, and you can systemize. Okay? That's why it's so important to get the, 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 the foundation piece right and to understand the principles behind how you build that model. So let's just kind of dive into it. So, so the big question I'm going to try and answer, really, in a nutshell, is, is what is the secret to sales success? What, what is it? What's the difference between you know, blowing off the charts and really struggling day in, day out to get customers? So we're, we're, going, to, we're going to try and nail that one. And specifically, what's the secret sales success as a startup? Because as a startup, you have some unique challenges. You don't have a brand. Uh, very often, you don't have a proven product. So you're you're asking customers to take you know to take a big risk, effectively, in, in you as, as as a company and your product. Um, so so there are some unique challenges uh, as a startup, and, and you know we really need to understand what those are and make sure we address them. So I'm talking about three, three lessons I learned in sales. So I've been in sales you know, 20, 25 odd years, always tech sales, I've worked for startups all the way through to, to big corporates, and I've done just about every sales role, you know, frontline sales role you, you can think of. Um, and along that way, I've learned three, 
probably the most important lessons I've learned in my life in terms of my career. And what I'm going to tell you about now is going to save you, I don't know, 15 years of frustration, excellent, and <laughs> torture. Okay? So these are the things, they must have taken me 15 years all in all to learn these things. So maybe I'm a slow learner, I don't know. But, um, but I think the reason it took me a long time to learn these lessons is because, you know, I come from the tech world and I started as an engineer. So, you know, a lot of us in the tech space, in fact, the reason I wanted to focus on B2B tech startups, A, I'm from a tech background, but B, there is a, there is a specific problem with tech startups in that a lot of the people involved in the company are technical people and we think logically. And we think logic is the way you sell things. And it actually, it isn't. Logic plays a role definitely, but we tend to assume with our engineering heads that logic is, is how, you, how you kind of convince somebody to buy something. So the first lesson I learned is that customers don't buy products, they buy outcomes in reality. Yes, you know, technically they buy a product, they pay you for a product, but what they're really buying is they're trying to buy an outcome. They want your product to achieve some kind of change or result. And that's the case really, whether it's B2C or B2B, people buy outcomes. And, you know, we spend our time trying to sell them products when really what's going on in their head is they're thinking about the outcome that that product's going to deliver. That's why they're buying a product. And, and this, this took me so long. And the reason, the reason I couldn't get this to start with was because, you know, I've worked for several companies who had the best products on the market without a shadow of a doubt. And yet, I was losing business to other companies who had lesser products. And I couldn't understand why. I, could, I just couldn't get why that was happening. We had the best products, clearly, better, faster, cheaper, in every respect, and yet the customer would buy from our competitor. And, and I didn't get it, because I thought they were buying products. So clearly, our product's better than that product. Why are they not buying a product? And it's because they were thinking about the outcome. So whether a product is best or not depends on what result you're trying to achieve with it and in what context, okay? So there's a lot of parameters that a customer is going on in the customer's mind about whether your product is best for what they're trying to achieve, okay, the outcome they're trying to achieve. So the more you can think about outcomes, the more you're gonna be in tune with what your customer really sees as value, okay, and what you position as value with your customers. So that was a massive lesson for me. Once I cottoned on to this and I really understood it, you have a totally different conversation with your customer, okay? Totally different conversation. Because as soon as you start talking about outcomes, they understand that you understand their problem and their challenge and what they're trying to solve. And yes, your product is an important component of that, but it's not the product itself, it's the outcome they're focused on. So when you understand this, and you position yourself as helping customers achieve outcomes, you're having a totally different conversation, and it, and it makes all the difference in the world. So the second massive lesson is that sales is not about persuasion. We all think sales is about being really good at persuading people about something or to do something, and it's about manipulation um, and, and using tricks, and sure, you know, there are psychological tricks. There are very common techniques that use in sales and marketing, psychological triggers and all sorts that you can use to drive people's behavior and influence them. But that's, that's kind of the cheesy side of sales. It's the kind of the, the used car salesperson image that, that people have of selling. And the reason a lot of people hate sales, you know, there might be a few people around here say, I hate sales, I don't like sales. And it's because sales is seen as a bit pushy and a bit kind of like manipulative. And it really isn't. The, what I learned, really, and I learned this from working with, you know, with some of the best salespeople in the industry along the way, is what they actually did. They just built trust with people. And that trust kind of led to momentum because all they did was they demonstrated that they understood what the customer was really trying to achieve, the outcome. And then they started showing them that not only do they understand what they're trying to achieve, but they understand how they can get them there. And they started, from the moment they engaged with the customer, they started showing them that and proving it to them. That generated trust, it moved the customer forward, and once the customer's in motion, as long as you continue 
to add value and help them, they're a body in motion. And that, and that you can build that momentum as you go through the sales cycle. In B2C, that trust and momentum can happen in seconds on a, on a single sales page, landing page, because it's a very simple, quick decision. In the B2B world, that trust and momentum might have to be done over you know, a period of time, a number of months as, as you go forward. And this all relates to the customer journey, which we'll, we'll talk about. So sales talk about persuasion is it's about building trust and momentum. You, you, you need to move the customer, you need to get the customer moving towards that. They need to feel that they're moving towards how they achieve this. And so there's lots of things you can do in your sales and marketing, which could be around education, offering insights, you know, helping them solve mini problems along the way to the outcome that they're really looking for. So sales is about trust and momentum. And, and again, if we build that into the way we sell, it's, it's much more effective. So the third thing is you need to choose your customers wisely. And the reason for that, again, we learned this the hard way, but this, there's, two, there's two primary reasons really. The first reason is if, you, if you're crystal clear about who your best customers are, who's your perfect customer, who's, who's the customer that you can help achieve the most important outcome for, okay? Who's the perfect fit for your company and what you do? Because when you target those people, you find it much easier to A, engage with them, and B, move them along that journey towards becoming a customer. It, it's, it's way easier if they're a good fit customer. If they're not a good fit, you'll find that really hard, really hard work. The second reason, and that, by the way, starts affecting your customer acquisition cost. If you're targeting the wrong or too broad a market, your customer acquisition cost is going to be high. Okay? You, need to, you need to zone in to your, to your target market and be clear about who you're targeting. You can have multiple target markets, by the way. You don't just have to have one. But the, the point is to have a very focused message and proposition for a clear target audience. So that's one reason. Okay? Loads of customer acquisition costs makes it much easier to engage and bring customers through the process. The other reason is it can be extremely painful, especially for a startup, if you win a bad customer. Okay, so I've been through this myself, where big opportunity, fought tooth and nail to win it, you know, we've discounted the hell out of it, hardly made any money on it, brought the customer on board thinking, brilliant, you know, we've, we've won this customer, amazing deal, only to find that the customer's a right pain in the arse. You know, they, they're not a good fit for what you do. They're not satisfied with your product. They're very demanding in terms of what they need. They want you to change the product you've sold them. And as a startup, you know, you just don't have the time or the resources to be dealing with people like that. So another good reason, choose your customers wisely because you want people who are going to be on your side. But you want a customer that you can not only win, but that you can then grow. You know, you talk about upselling. Yeah. Yeah, you, well, you need the right customer. You need the customers who come on board, get some real value from that initial thing, and then see that they can get loads more value by going to steps two, three, and four. If you get the wrong customer in, that doesn't happen. You know, you end up with, with customers that are a drag, um, and you know, they, they just drain your, your energy and resources. So choosing your customers is, is important you know, for those two, two key reasons. So I, I want to put this up, a couple of quotes I'm going to put up, because I can't find a better way of summarising what business is. Okay, I don't know if anybody knows Ryan Sharp. He, he's one of these gurus. He works with billionaires and people like that. Really, around a lot of it's their mindset in terms of how you know how do you take a seven-figure company to an eight-figure company to a ten-figure company. A lot of it's mindset, and uh, so he works them on that. What he said is, you know, what is business? Business is the, you know, the business of commerce is human connection and value delivery. And that absolutely hits the nail on the head. That's exactly what it is. Human connection is, is really important. In the B2C world, that is actually done quite well because we recognize that we're dealing with individuals, with human beings, and we, and we treat them as such. Our messaging generally is as if we're talking to another human being. In the B2B world, it's terrible. We think we're selling to companies and organizations, and in reality, we're selling to other human beings. You know, that, that's, that's the fact. So in the B2B world, this is a massive area that is missing out, and, and you know, we could take a lot of lessons from the B2C world. 
and, and I'm starting to see that happen in the B2B world. This is so powerful because decisions are made with emotion a lot of the time, even though we don't like to think that's the case. Even when businesses put in you know, place um, frameworks for how they go about buying things to try and make sure it's not a biased process, the reality is there are people involved, there are stakeholders, and the stakeholders have personal and vested interests, and that influences the way they think. So if you can connect to the human level on, on the personal elements, that does have a, a big impact. And business is about value delivery. It's about understanding the outcome they're trying to achieve, and, and, and value is really how you help them move towards that outcome. So yes, your product absolutely is, is a key piece of it, but it's, it's your whole company. It's everything you do as a company. You know, your, your customer service, the way you sell to people, how you help them, um, how you help them influence, you know, what you know, the product or service you provide. There's a whole package of things that goes around this, this area of, of value delivery. I, I call it value alignment, which is saying, don't just think about building a great product. You've really got to build a great company because you, your product's you know, the cornerstone of it, absolutely, but you, you've got to wrap everything you can. You've got to align all the resources and skills and capabilities in your business behind the outcome that your product helps them achieve. So, so if, you, if you think a little bit more broadly, value delivery is, is really about what your company can do for your customer, not just what the product does. It'd be radically helpful is another one of these, which, you know, this is, again, this is what I've seen top salespeople do um, from the moment they engage with, with customers, they are adding value from the moment they have the first conversation. They, they really are, in subtle ways a lot of the time, but they're, they're not selling, they're helping. That's, that's, what, they're, that's what they're actually doing. And, it, and it's, it's really powerful. So Jay Abraham, he, he's a guy who, he's, um, he's a guru in terms of joint ventures. You know, he, he's an expert in, in, in how companies can create um, collaborative joint ventures. And one of his things is, if you truly believe that what you have is useful and valuable to your clients, then you have a moral obligation to try to serve them in every way possible. And, and it's, it's really an expansion around this, don't just think about your product, think about your company and how you move, how you move your customers forward. You know, they're at point A, they want to get an outcome, which is point B. How, how do you help them move from A to B? Okay, so definitely, Definition of value is really this. It's everything we do to help our customers achieve a valuable outcome. Okay, so I want to talk about this one because, again, this is one I learned the hard way. I call it the silent sales assassin because it's something you, we, we generally, in our heads, we ignore. Um, and this is particularly relevant for startups, but it, it also applies to bigger companies. So the silent sales assassin, the thing that will kill a lot of sales is risk, okay, or perceived risk. So your customer, when they look at your company, because you know they're not just looking at your product, they're looking at your product and company, in their head, consciously or subconsciously, they will see risks, okay? And the risks relate to the outcome that they're trying to achieve. So they're looking at buying a product or service to achieve a goal, an outcome. And they'll be looking at, okay, what are the potential risks here of working with this particular company? And if you're a startup, there are a ton of risks. You know, does your product actually work? You know, do you have an engineering team that can fix bugs reasonably quickly? What is the product roadmap? How solid is that product roadmap? Um, can you provide support in different countries maybe? You know, do you provide 24/7 support? There's a whole, there's a whole load of things um, that, when a startup in particular, customers see as being very risky. Okay, so the thing is, you have to first of all acknowledge that there's risk. Okay, you have to understand and accept and see the risk from your customer's point of view, and then what you need to try and do is mitigate the risk. And you know, there's only so much mitigation you can do as a startup. But there, there, there are ways of reducing the perceived risk of the customer. Well, one, is to, one is to kind of demonstrate that you know what you're doing and you can help them. But another one is you, you, know, you, can, you can mitigate it in, in the way you offer your products and services to them, which we'll talk about in a, in a bit. But 
you know, th this is something that, you know, when I look back on some of the deals I've lost in the past, this actually was a big factor. Even when I was working for big companies, and again, the, the, the risk is, it's, it's so important to put yourself in your customer's shoes so to understand how they see the risk, okay? Because from your point of view, you understand your product in your company, and you say, no, this, you know, this, there's no, there's no risk with our company. We're an established company. We've been doing business for a long time. We've got customers. But again, your customers are looking at this from an, out an outcome perspective, and they will see, are you the best company with the best product to help us achieve the outcome? And they will be looking at risk in that way. Okay, so they, they see things slightly differently. So beware of risk. So, secret to sales success, in a phrase, is what I call value acceleration. It's just kind of a term I use. So it's, it's being able to bring that outcome forward, uh, improve it, make it easier, uh, make it faster. That's, that's really what you're trying to do. That's what you're trying to do to differentiate yourself in the market, is accelerate value. And you do it really through, come up, being clear who you serve, being very targeted, focusing on the outcome, and then the final piece is, is leading them there, okay? Because a lot of companies, in terms of the outcome they're looking for, they don't know how to get there, or they think they know how to get there, but actually you could help them get there a lot faster, because you've got knowledge and experience about what you do that, that could help them, not just your product, but your, your knowledge and uh, experience. So helping them, you know, having a clear customer journey from the moment you engage with them to getting them to the point where they become a customer and they then realise the value for what it is you're doing is really important, okay? So your sales model really should help you get totally clear on who you serve, clearly understand the outcome that you help them achieve, and it needs to give you a process or a framework or how you're going to engage with that prospect and then help them move forward to becoming a customer and then ultimately getting the outcome that they want from your product or service. Even with some uh, new companies with new proposition coming to the marketplace, yeah. the outcome might not necessarily be very clear at that stage. Mm -hmm. Do you come across that type um, of scenarios? Well, I think when, when, when somebody wants to, if somebody's going to buy something, there is some kind of result they have in mind. That's the reason they buy it. You know, they're, they're, they're buying it for some kind of a reason, a, a result, an outcome of some sort. You know, it might be to solve a problem, a particular pain they've got. Um, th th there's, there's always a, a sort of a, an end game, if you like, that they're looking for. And the key thing is to understand what that is. That, that, that's really fundamental, is, is understanding what the outcome is. Because if, if you're trying to sell a product or service, that delivers an outcome that's not actually that important to somebody, I'm going to really struggle to sell that product or service. So half the, half the trick really, if you understand your target market and your customer, you know what it is they're trying to achieve, you know what the really important customer outcomes are. You know, if, if, you, can, if you can help somebody, I don't know, simplify a particular process, let's say, you've got an application that helps them, I, I, I don't know, simplify uh, their HR process, for example. Well, there are some companies for whom that is critical, okay? That is a major goal that they want to achieve for, for various reasons for their company. Other companies, it's a nice to have, you know? Be, yeah, be, yeah, yeah, we'd like to have a better HR process or a smoother process, but it's not a top priority. And this is where, you know, it's about understanding your target market is Based on you know the solution you have and, and, and how it helps people, who gets the most value from it? Okay, who is it most valuable to? Because it's not going to be everybody. So that's that's really you know a key element of, of, of your sales model is getting clear on what is this really important outcome that your target market needs that you can help with. Because if it's not that important, you know your your value proposition is, is kind of undermined straight away. So if you think that the outcome is not that important, then maybe you know you may, might be targeting the wrong industry. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. It, it's. It's. Yeah. It, it's. It's 
you know, we'll, we'll cover it on the sales yeah. frame, but one of the questions to ask is, you know, you know, who who gets the most benefit from this outcome? Who sees the most value in this outcome? You know, what kind of companies, what kind of individuals within the company, you know, who has the most to gain from solving this problem, from achieving this outcome? That's what you've got to zone in on, that's what that's what you've got to really target. Okay, because that's that's what value is, okay? That's what people buy. They buy uh, they're, they're buying that outcome or, or something, a solution to get to that outcome. If the outcome doesn't have a high perceived value, then they're probably not going to put the time and effort into achieving it or, or they won't put much money into achieving it because it's just not that important to them. Martin, in, in your sales, enterprise sales, yeah. especially selling to Vodafone and others, yeah. you must have multiple people within the same organization you've got yeah. to sell to. Absolutely, and yeah. is that pretty much fixed, let's say, selling to O2 versus O2? Uh, yeah. Vodafone or is it drastically different? Um, no, it follows the same structure in terms of who's in charge of maximising the number of connections and focused on quality, but the issue we have is that the budget holders are always different. And yeah. you know in sales, mm -hmm. right, unless you can identify those key stakeholders and who's got the budget, Absolutely. you're pretty knackered, aren't you? Yeah. 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 So that's why, like, you know, for some we can close them down quickly because we know the organization really well, so we can get the buy in from the relevant parties, and some we don't know them that well. So we've got to put the donkey work into finding the stakeholders, mm. really. Yeah. The key's the budget holder for us. If you can, yeah. if you can fo zero in on the budget holder and say, we know from your annual report you're trying to do all these things, yeah. our solution ticks off four of them. Do you want to find out more? Yeah. That's where we get pretty quick traction. With people that bother to answer emails, obviously, or bother to pick up voicemail. Yeah, and, that, and that's the challenge with B two B in that kind of environment, you know, where you've got multiple stakeholders. Um, your messaging, again, you've got to be thinking about the outcome, the the way they see the outcome, you know, because the you know the the FD has a different view of why a certain outcome is important compared to someone in the HR department, for yeah. example. So it, it's understanding what the stakeholders are looking for in terms of their outcome, and then how to um, you know, connect with them, uh, you know, on, on that message point. Really, you know, what, whatever it is. So it, it, you've got to understand the stakeholders, understand how they perceive the outcome, and in terms of what's important to them. And then your messaging's got to got to relate to that. That's why we love annual reports because the annual yeah. reports generally st state key objectives for the organisation, and you can you can if you can align your product or service to those objectives. Yeah. Because a lot of the people that work in these organisations don't know the objectives, right? Yeah. So if you can say we pull these from your annual report, it's a key. Blah, 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 you're on, you know you're on message straight away. <laughs> you know you're not trying to kind of sell something that they don't want if yeah. you frame it right. Yeah. Is it? You, you, you've got to be talking about something they care about. Um, as you know, based on their their role within the organisation. So yeah, yeah, and that I mean that is one of the things that does make B two B you know challenging. So in terms of leading them there, really leading them there is about creating belief, um, belief that they can actually get the outcome that they want uh, by by working with you. Um, strengthen the desire, you know, which is really more around why you are the best fit in terms of helping them get that outcome because they may have uh, you know other options. But it, it, it's, it's building that desire that you know you're you're the right company uh, to be working with, and it's about reducing friction and risk as well. Um, so we've already talked about risk, but it's amazing, really, uh, and, th and this is particularly relevant at, at kind of the beginning, I suppose, of the sales process when, when we're trying to engage with people. You see this a lot on um, websites where you're trying to tempt someone to engage with you, but some people you know, make it harder than they need to. They, they, they make it complicated uh, or, or <coughs> complex to, to really begin that engagement. It's either because people are, you know, they, they're not getting straight to the point in terms of how they can help someone. So, so the customer's a bit gray in terms of, well, I'm not entirely clear what you do or how you help me. Um, so that creates friction or you just create friction in terms of how the customer can move forward through the customer journey. You just just make it hard, you know. Uh, an, an example of seeing, you know, you might just put something up, you know, something to uh, a 
lead magnet of some sort, or I call them a value hook, where you want someone to, I don't know, download a report or something, because you've got something valuable to share with them, and they think, oh, yeah, okay, that's relevant to me. Download the report, and, and you know, you're asking for name, address, telephone number, company. You, know, you ask for that. That's friction, basically. Um, friction is an interesting one because you can actually use it to your advantage, but generally speaking, you want to reduce friction. You want to make it easy for people to get what you do. And if there's something you, some value you can provide up front early on, make it easy for them to get that value. Okay, make it simple and clear, you know, bite-sized chunks that will that will get them engaged and get them moving forward. Where where you can use friction, usually a bit further into the process, is when you really want to qualify people who are serious, particularly in the B2B world. If you're selling higher value products, you might actually want to introduce some friction because you want to filter out the people who are not serious and only let the serious motivated people through. And one way of doing that is to put a bit of friction in the process because only the people who are serious will move forward and, and overcome that little bit of friction because they, you know, they have a, a strong desire to solve their problem or, or achieve this particular outcome. But you know, you, you, mainly you want to reduce friction. Make it easy, make it clear, you know, give people information in, in simple bite-sized chunks. Yeah, and sometimes when you do enterprise sales, you have a, almost like a sponsor in the the, the customer's organization that yeah. you gel well and the, the individual want what you're trying to sell. But then you suddenly find out he moves on or leaves the job, whatever it is, the whole sale process collapses yeah. and there's nobody to pick up the pieces. Yeah. How do you overcome that? You know. Well, I mean, that that is a difficult one, yeah, and I, I've experienced that one, you know, loads and loads of different times. I think really it, it's it's about, you know, understanding the wider stakeholder group and making an effort to try and, you know, establish a relationship with, with that stakeholder group. Because it's, it's usually, in that kind of scenario, there's usually more than one person. So it's about, um, you know, building that slightly wider contact point within the organisation. But yeah, yeah. You know, it's really hard because you know, if you build a relationship with someone and, and everything hangs on that relationship, they're gone. You've got to start yeah. from scratch, really. And obviously, the new person comes in, and usually, the new person wants to make their mark, so they'll they'll do things differently because they're trying to make their mark. Um, so often, they'll bring in their own preferred suppliers or you know whatever. So it's, it's, it is quite a it's not an easy one to overcome. Mm. But I think yeah, if you can if you can have you know, two or three contacts in there that you, you know, stakeholders you've got a relationship with, then that's, um, you know, that, that can help. But yeah, it's, it's, it's not an easy one. I've got a quick question. Yeah. So you call it value acceleration. Yeah. So if you had something and you went to a B2B business and said, okay, you know, we kind of get it. And, you, and you're like, well, you know what? That's not really good enough. I wish they'd said, okay, we'll do it. Is it worth doing like a, I call it a combi builder? So what you're doing, you add on more and then you can sell it to more B2Bs. I call that a value accelerator. Yeah, yeah. So, you so see what I'm saying? So you've got, you've got a, what you're saying, a narrowish product. So you've got something that you know is for your market. Yeah, yeah. So you make your, what you've got better. Yeah. Add another combine like a add, add another factor into it. Yeah. So it's like buying a chocolate bar, you buy a Twix, don't you? It's yeah. like two, two yeah. and one. So with that, can you hit can you hit more sales for more B two B? Yeah, you, you, you can do that. So so here's the thing though. When when you're starting out in the early stages uh, as a startup, mm. the key is focus. Okay. So what I would say is, what you're trying to get initially is traction. Okay. And the, the, the fastest way to get traction is to be really narrow, really focused on, 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 a, on a, even if it's only a very small segment of the market that, that's not going to be big enough for you longer term, focus on the sweet spot, your low hanging fruit, your absolute perfect fit customers, you know, the, the ones that are a great fit. Win them first because they're going to be the easiest ones to win. Okay. As a startup, you generally don't have a lot of resources that you can throw at winning customers. So, Focus it, narrow it right down to the easy ones to start with. Win them, learn from the process of winning from them, because that's really a manual process initially. You're generally reaching out and it's one-to-one -one stuff. This is not the automated 
scaled, systemized version of selling. This is the one-to-one -one manual process that helps you learn how to build the right model, okay, initially. So you do it manually, very, very narrow to the target market, because let's be honest, if you can't sell to them, you're not gonna sell to anybody else, okay? So get that bit right, get that working, learn from that, and then once you've got a, once you've got a proven model, you say, okay, we've figured out now how to sell to these people. So you've got a working model, a basic working model. So there's a couple of things you can do. You can now systemize that, okay? Put it into a process, maybe automate some of it, and try and go after more of that market. That's one thing. The other thing you can do is you can say, okay, let's pick an adjacent market. So we pick them, but these companies are pretty similar to them. They're not the same, but they have very similar requirements. And we know this model works for them because we've proven it. If we were to add this, and maybe change our messaging slightly, we could go after them. So you, you sort of, you go after what I call adjacent markets or adjacent audiences. Rather than go here and then go over there, totally different audience market, go there and then go to the ones kind of next or related in some way. That's, that's exactly what I meant. Yeah, that's the way to do it. Yeah. But I think that what I see with, a, with quite a few startups is, you know, they've got a product that potentially a lot of different, you know, let's say you're selling a CRM system for SMBs. Well, you know, that's a massive market, okay? So they say, yeah, anyone can use it. You know, plumbers can use it, lawyers can use it, any, anybody can use it. So we'll, you know, we'll, we'll shotgun blast everything out because what we want is awareness. We want to just get out and make everyone aware of what we do. It's the wrong approach because you haven't got the resources to follow up on that, okay? And to, to give it the necessary focus. What you need to do is say, yeah, yeah, it could be valuable to all these people, but actually, do you know what? It's, it's lawyers, it's legal companies, it's the real sweet spot because of the type of feature set we've got or because of the way it integrates with some of their other systems. Whatever it is, you say that is the absolute perfect customer, as near as we can get. So you go after them. So all your messaging, everything you do, and the way you position yourself is we specialize in CRMs for medium-sized legal company. You know, the, 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 the narrower you can make it, the more effective you're gonna be initially, okay? okay. Now you can, it is possible to go too narrow, but, but, but generally speaking, that's what you wanna be doing is, is, is narrowing it down. So, uh, just sorry, picking up. Uh, so Russell and I, or Russell, yeah. I've sort of given Russell a task saying, can you try to get to 100K revenues to prove that you've got a decent business before we start looking at raising funding. So Russell's been active going out, um, you know that, right, Russell? And, and, you know, done 60 events. But what you are doing is you're selling to anyone who wants to buy at this stage, right? I'm focused on customers, uh, on businesses of a certain size. So I've got, it doesn't matter to me what industry they're yeah. in, but it, it really depends what size they are. Yeah. So I am being quite focused in that regard, right. yeah. even though it's a lot of different yeah. types of businesses. So, yeah. so let's say that also get the 100K, yeah. then what is a better strategy then at that point to look at certain industries or still well, look at the headcount? Well, if, if you, let's say you've got to 100K and, and you've done it without being particularly focused, yeah. okay, you're focusing on the customer size, but yeah. it could be different sectors, you know, whatever. Then what I would try and do is I'd look to see, uh, you know, is, 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 does the data show you that there's particular types of companies within there that, you know, oh, just happens to be, we've got quite a few legal firms in there, or, or you know, is there, is there one market that you're finding you're resonating with more than others, or a certain type of customer? It doesn't even need to be a, a vertical per se. It, it could just be certain characteristics about customers you've got in that initial 100K that you think, yeah, you know, we. We really found it easy to win those guys. You know, it was quite easy, it was quite painless. They're good customers, right? We want more of them. So it's about it's about identifying mm. the characteristics of your ideal customers, what they are. Now, initially, you have to assume or guesstimate what those things are, and you and you point, you know, you fire a rifle and you, rather than a shotgun. You use your rifle, you aim that target, and you see how you get on. You know, and sometimes you need to change it and, and, and adapt it, but. Um, that, that's what I would do. I mean, again, if you think about the value that your product or service ultimately delivers to somebody, the outcome you, that you help them achieve, 
it's a case of thinking, okay, what companies really resonate with that outcome? What companies does that really help the most? Because it will help some more than others. And it's, and it's about figuring out what characterizes those companies. It could be the vertical they're in, it, it could be their size, it could be something completely different. But it's, it, it's understanding what it is. And then, then everything, everything focuses down on that. Okay, that that's, it's that focus that gives you the, um, the progress, really. The, the ability to penetrate into accounts, customers, vertical sectors, you know, markets, whatever it is. Um, now, where, where you can go too narrow is, you see, at the end of the day, whatever market, whatever niche you target, you, they, they've got to be a group or an audience that you can reach. So if you go too narrow, there's no obvious way that you can reach them, okay? So they, they, they've got to be almost like a tribe, I refer to it as like a tribe. They've got to be a tribe. They've got to have certain things in common, certain characteristics, and they and you can reach them in certain areas. Maybe, they, maybe they're members of certain industry organization, maybe they follow certain influencers, maybe they um, go to certain events or exhibitions, whatever <coughs> it is, you've got to be able to reach them with your message. Okay, so if you go too narrow and too specific, you, you, it's, it's almost impossible to find out where those people congregate because they don't really. Um, so that's, that's sort of the balance point is go as narrow as you can, but make sure you have a place where you can reach them as some kind of vehicle to get to them, if that makes sense. Okay. Right. Okay, um, so we've kind of gone through all the, all the principles and stuff, and, and really what I was just going to do now is, is just show you what the Sales Acceleration Canvas is. It's, it's a very simple framework. Um, so it's a framework that, that, that guides kind of actions, uh, and you can go as deep as you like with it, but I'll, I'll share the framework with you, and then uh, uh, hopefully you'll, you'll find it useful. So in terms of what it is, so it's a simple framework that helps you create a laser-focused sales model. I call that a sales acceleration blueprint. Okay, so it's the, it's the basic structure or model that's, that, that will get you moving forward. It's the foundation for creating powerful customer value because the framework really kind of forces you to think about outcomes and what your customer really is trying to achieve and how you communicate that to them. And it, it, you know. I think of it as a tool that keeps you focused on what matters because, you know, we all experience it. When you, when you don't have uh, a framework or something to keep you on task, it's so easy to shoot off at a tangent and go around in circles and in all kinds of directions. So I think, you know, what, what this framework does, because it is simple, it's a simple framework, I, I think, you know, it's as simple as I've been able to, to make it. Uh, it just makes it much easier to stay on task and stay focused on the right things and keep thinking about the right things. So, so this, this is it in a nutshell, it, it, it's kind of these, well, it, it's really these, these five boxes, it's just a, a notes area. And when I coach people through it, we kind of, we go through sort of left to right and then, and then down here. So we start by looking at the, what we call the, the, the customer promise. So what is it that basically you're helping your customer to achieve? What is the outcome that you're, you're, you're promising to uh, effectively help them get to? Your audience, you know, who's your target market, both in terms of the type of, if you're B2B, the companies you're focusing on, the individuals within the company, you know, who exactly, which human beings is it that you're going to be targeting with your messaging. Uh, then there's the messaging itself, um, which is really, you know, all about, from the initial point of contact, something I call a value hook, all the way through to presenting your offer to them, so to then becoming a customer. Uh, that's your messaging. Then the offer, which is a critical piece for a lot of companies. You know, this is a massive area where you can, um, especially when you're scaling up, when you're, when you're trying to systemize and scale up, the way you package and structure that offer you know, can make a massive difference in terms of your conversion rates, okay? So getting clear on what your offer is and how you package it and how you position it is, is, is really important. And then this bit here, you know, this is about systems, thinking about, because the challenge with all of this, 
right, with, with anything, is you have to do it consistently. You, you can't kind of mess about with it. You, you've got to have a structure, you've got to be committed to it, and you've got to, you've got to be consistent. And, and it's the systems piece that can help you be consistent, you know. Um, and the system could be something as basic as a spreadsheet that you just use to drive yourself forward, or a calendar. Um, but then, you know, depending on what you're actually trying to do with your messaging and your tactics, it could be all sorts of things in there. Yeah, it could be a, you know, email autoresponders, a CRM system, a webinar platform. You know, there's a whole load of tools and systems, depending on what you're trying to do, that you, you probably need to think about here. And obviously where that really starts to come into play is once you've manually proven your model works, that's how you systemize it and you, know, you scale it up. Okay. So that's, that's the framework. Um, and then, you know, I, I'm just gonna rip through these pretty quickly, but you know, the, these are the kind of things that you need to be thinking about. So your customer promise, you know, who, first of all, who is it you serve? What is the, I, I, call it, I call it a MECO, most important customer outcome. Because you might be thinking, well, there's lots of different things that we can help our customers with. You know, there's various different outcomes or benefits. The key is to figure out what's the most important one in your customer's mind, okay? What is it they care about the most? Try and focus on that one. Because again, if you say, if you go out to market with a message that says, and, and again, you'll see this all the time on people's websites, we do this, we do this, 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 you know, we can help you X, Y, Z, A, B, C, D, one, two, three. And I suppose in, in, in our minds, we're thinking, well, look at all this, you know, we can do all this great stuff, you know, look at how good we are. But when your customer's looking at it, there's, there's kind of just one thing really, there's one outcome that they're trying to achieve, one goal or one objective. And so really you need to remove the clutter and just say, this is the thing we really help with. Yeah, of course you can help with lots of other things, but those things are less important and they take the emphasis away from the core outcome that you can help them achieve, all right? So, you know, focus on what I call the most important customer outcome. You know, maybe there's two or three things, but I would always try and stick with the primary core value that you, that you add. Think about what pain do you help them avoid because, you know, people, you know, People either move forward because they see an opportunity or they move forward because they're trying to avoid some pain, okay? And generally, pain is stronger than opportunity. So, you know, pain's a bigger motivator for people to do something than, than an opportunity. Um, but I'm a big believer in combining the two because usually, if you eliminate the pain, you, you, you've actually opened up an opportunity for them because the pain is stopping them from achieving an opportunity. So it's a carrot and stick thing. If you can position, if you can create a, a proposition that's all about eliminating some pain and then opening up an opportunity for them, kind of two in one, that's, that's a very powerful um, story to tell. So think about the pain you help them avoid, obviously the outcome you help them achieve. And this is really important, your unique value. In other words, what is it that makes you uniquely different in helping them achieve this outcome or avoid this pain, okay? It, and, and that uniqueness doesn't necessarily have to be your product or a feature. It could be the culture of your company can be a unique differentiator, okay, in, in the right circumstances. It, it can be anything, really, it, it, but it's, it's, you know, what makes you different? Because remember I said at the beginning, customers look at who they think is the best fit for achieving an outcome. Well, best fit is a combination of things. It's yes, it's product and product features, but it's it's your company. You know, it, it's it's the the value added services you wrap around your product. It's it's just how you help them in general. You know, what is, what is your unique value? Um, what makes you different in the context of achieving the outcome? There's no point in saying you're unique if your uniqueness doesn't directly relate to what you know your outcome that you're helping them with. Your uniqueness has to directly relate to what it is you're helping them with. Otherwise, it's it's not really relevant. Being different in itself isn't valuable. Okay. Being different 
and unique in terms of the value you add, that's, you know, that is important, that's key. Okay, so the audience, who cares the most? Who cares the most about the outcome that you can help them achieve? Okay? Some people, some companies, some individuals will care more than others. They have more to win or more to lose. Lose being the most powerful motivator, okay? It's pain, okay? If you can help them solve a problem, avoid a pain, that's the people who are gonna care the most. Who is the best fit? Remember, you're a startup, so the way your customers perceive you will be heavily influenced by that. Since so the risk they see, they're not just gonna look at your product, they're gonna look at you potentially as your company you know, we're this, you know, the, your customer's going, well, we're this kind of company, we're this size, you know, we have these kind of requirements and demands. Your product may be great and unique, but we're not sure that your company really is the right fit for us. You're not big enough, you're not in enough countries, you don't have enough uh, support staff, whatever it is, you know. This, you know, it's, you have to have that fit, and, it, and it's a cultural fit a lot of the time. You know, if you're a forward-thinking, innovative company, um, you probably need to be targeting forward-thinking, innovative customers, okay? Otherwise, you're gonna be trying to win business from conservative companies, whereas, whereas you see innovation, they see risk, okay? Because their mindset's different. So it's important to, to think about you know what you represent to your your customers. They they've got to see you as yeah. You know this company can move me forward. They can they can you know, they, they can help me move forward. So yeah, all, all these things come into it in terms of thinking about best fit. And how can you reach them? We've already touched on it. This is really key because you know you can't scale up and you can't systemize if there's no specific way you can reach that target audience. Okay. If the only way you can reach out to them is to do hours and hours of research on LinkedIn or something to find a customer and then approach that customer, you can do that for your first handful of customers maybe, but you can't scale that up. There's no way you can scale that up, not, not cost effectively. So how can you reach them? You, you need a target market, a target audience where you have a way of reaching them. Okay, messaging. Um, what are your value hooks? So I've talked about this. This is, this is the way you initially engage a prospect. Uh, I'll talk a bit more about value hooks. What is the customer journey? So I, I mentioned leadership. You have to lead them. You know, you have to show them the way, as it were, how you get them, create belief that they can do it, show them how they're going to do it, make them believe that you're the right company to get them there, or your product's the right product to get them there as well. Um, what is the customer journey? And there's two elements to that journey. There is the practical journey of steps A, B, and C to get the outcome we want. And there is the mental journey, which we're, we're, we'll, we'll talk about in a minute. What is your style of brand? So again, it's very, it's very important from your messaging to be consistent with who you are as a company, your culture, what you're about. Uh, also relates to your, your target audience as well, potentially. You know, if, 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 your, if your style or brand doesn't resonate with your target audience, that could be a problem. It's gonna be hard to make that connection with them and build that, build that trust. Uh, then we move on to the offer. So your messaging, what your messaging is really designed to do is get them ready to hear this, okay? Get them ready to hear the offer. What a lot of companies do, there's, there's either two things they do, they either do this too early, they present the offer too early, you know, it's a bit like meeting somebody saying, hi, you know, yeah, we get on really well, let's get married. It's like, you know, it's, it's, it's too much too soon, it just, it just doesn't, doesn't work. So if you, try and, if you try and put an offer in front of somebody too early, it's going to fail. Your messaging is about leading them to the point where they want to hear this. Okay? It's the logical next step is for them to hear how you take them forward. Because if you think about it, we're talking about this journey of you engage with the customer, take them all the way through to them achieving an outcome. At some point in the middle is where they become a customer, okay? Because they don't get the outcome, they become a customer and then the outcome follows on from there. So there's a journey from A to B, you engage with them at point A, you're helping them get to point B, and in order to do that, at some point, they've got to become a customer so that they can use your product or service to get there. 
So the whole messaging and journey is about building trust and momentum. So when you get to the point where they need to become a customer so that you can really help them with your product or service, it, it's a natural point. It's a natural place for them to hear the offer and how you move them forward. So it's, it's really just a transition. An offer is really transitioning the relationship. Um, and it, you know, this, this whole fear of trying to close a deal, close sales, becomes much easier when you position this at the right time and in the right context. You know, it, it's, it's no longer a pushy thing to do. It's a natural, logical thing that your customer's gonna want to, want to understand. You know, how do we move forward? What's, what's the deal here? You know, how do we work together? What's the cost? You know, what's the, how do we do it? So, so that's, that's your offer. Um, you just think about how you create outstanding value in it. Uh, you know, because that, again, that reduces friction, makes it easier for your customer to make a decision. How can you minimize risk? It's really important. And th your offer is really where you can mitigate a lot of the risk. Um, we'll, 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 we'll talk about that in a minute and how you can do that. Time. How can you make it simple? Offers have to be simple, really. Uh, sometimes that's hard in the B2B world because you have lots of options, lots of packages, but generally, uh, and this is particularly true when you're systemizing it, you need to keep it simple, okay? I see a lot of SaaS companies, actually, you know, in fact, I think you do it, Marge, on, on your uh, Texero pages, there's sort of like a bronze, silver, gold option, mm. you know, there's this low-end offer, there's this middle offer, and then there's a high-end offer, and usually they, you know, the middle one's the best value. Typically, that, that's a standard kind of sales psychology thing, but that, that's, that's good, that's pretty simple. It's not asking customers to make too many decisions. It's like, well, is this, this, and this? Okay, that's the right one. It's when, it's, it's when you have loads of different options and you're thinking in your head, well, I, you know, I can tailor it to exactly what my customer wants. Yes, that there is some value in that, but oftentimes, when you're trying to scale up and systemize it, it just creates friction and it makes it harder to make a decision. There's a, there's a classic um, thing, uh, they, they, they tested how this impacts people and they, they went to a market store and they were selling jam and I think they had, they, 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 what they did, they put six pots of jam out, different flavors and sort of give people plenty of choice and they monitored sales of, of the jams. And then they did it again, but they only had three flavors of jam. So less choice, less customer choice. And they sold way more when they only had three pots of jam on the table. Which you think, wow, you know, weird, you know, because you're actually reducing potentially your target market because the, the people who like apricot jam can't get the apricot jam anymore because it's, it's just not there. But, you know, it's the fact that it was an easier decision to make. It's this one, that one, that one. And when there's six, it's like, oh, I don't know, well, I, like that one. I don't know, I'll come back, I'll have a think about it and I'll come back. You know, so it's, it's you know, simplicity is really, is really important. Systems, what tools you need, we, we talked about this, you know, again, this is about helping you be consistent. What skills or people do you need? So it might not just be about tools, it might be, you know, there might be skills, you might need copywriting skills, for example. Have you got copywriting skills? Maybe you have, maybe you haven't. And maybe that's really important. Um, if you're creating a, you know, a sales video, uh, do you have the, the ability to do that? Do you need outside help? Um, you know, social media. If you're running a social media campaign, maybe you need some outside help with that kind of thing. So it's about it's about thinking, putting these these building blocks in place to be consistent and in order to scale it. What is the bottleneck? That, that's always the question really to ask, is okay, what, what's holding us back, okay? Um, is, it, is it the tools and systems we have or don't have? Is it we don't have the right people? You know, what is it that's, that's, uh, that's gonna prevent us from, from executing consistently? Okay, so that, that's the canvas, we've sort of whistled through it, but so, so these are really what you think about. And if, and if you can answer these questions, at least to some level, that starts to create your blueprint, which then drives your specific tactics of, of, of how you go to market, you know, what messaging you're gonna use, what platforms you're gonna reach your, your uh, target audience on, and all those, all those kind of things. I won't do 
that now because we're a bit short of time. May may come back to that. Uh, okay, so so messaging. I'm just, just going to fly through this really. Um, so I mentioned that this, your, your messaging is really taking them on a on a mental journey. Okay, so there's the practical journey of how they get their outcome, practical steps. But there's this mental journey that they need to go on, which is really where your messaging plays an important role. So initially, this is a model I've come up with. Is there's, there's other models you can look at, but this is the one I tend to use. The first point is understanding. They've got to understand why you are relevant to them. That, that's really the first thing. Why is this company relevant to me? Secondly, once they understand what it is and how you help them, why you're relevant, they've got to believe that you can do what you say you can do. Okay? They've got to believe. So that could be case studies, that sort of thing. It could be just sorry. proving, sorry, proving your knowledge and understanding of things. You know, help educating them, offering them insights on things. So believe they've got to believe you can get them where they want to go. Excitement is really the point where they start to realise that you have a unique way of doing it that's valuable to them. Okay, so they now see that you're you're different to other options that they may have for getting this outcome. And they start to get excited because they see that value as being particularly relevant to them. And then in their head, they're starting to see, see themselves using your product or service. They're, they're already starting to think, yep, okay, I see how this fits, I see where, the, where this would work. Okay. And then finally, it, it's, it's, and really this, this is, the receptive bit is really a consequence of, of getting to that point. They're receptive, they're now ready for your offer. If you try and introduce your offer before that point, it's the wrong time, the timing's wrong. They're not gonna be ready to move forward, or it's unlikely they're gonna be ready to move forward. So the messaging is about taking them on that mental journey and getting them to the point where you're gonna generate, or you're gonna present them with an irresistible offer. So I call it you know, an irresistible offer because at this point, you've built trust, you've built momentum, you've built, you've gotten to the point where they're quite excited about, yep, yeah, we think this is the right company to work with, the right products, whatever. Now, you don't want to fall flat when you present the offer in front of them, okay? You need something that's going to punch them through the finish line, as it were, get them over the line to become a customer. So you need, you need a compelling offer, okay? So, you probably won't see this, it's too small. So, it needs to be simple, so the sort of key characteristics. It's got to be simple, okay? It needs to maximize perceived customer value. So whatever you can do the, you know, to package as much value as you can in your offer to get them as far towards the outcome they want as you can, that's what you want to try and do. Package and position the full value that you're delivering you know, with the outcome in mind or the result they're trying to get. And you need to minimize risk, okay? Because, as I've already said, risk is, is probably the main thing. When you get this far down the line, risk is the thing that will stop them pulling the trigger at the end. They'll just think there'll be something in the back of their mind that they're not comfortable with. There's a risk that you haven't mitigated enough for them, okay? So, so in your offer, you know, these things like guarantees, you could go pay as you go subscription module. That's uh, a subscription model. You could include various services, um, support, training. There's a number of things you could package in to lower the risk, okay, or to, to reduce the risk. And, and finally, what I'd say in terms of pricing. So, and again, this is this depending on your business, whether you're B two C or other things, but. And it depends very much on the market you're in and competitors. But I'm a big believer in value-based pricing. So if you're doing a good job of selling somebody on an outcome you can help them achieve, and if that outcome's big for them and it's important, then the price really should reflect the value that you're delivering. Okay? Or the price can reflect the value you're delivering. And what I always say to people is I said, try and think of it in terms of 10 to 1. Now, meaning you're going to deliver 10 times the value 
of the price they're going to pay for your product. So if you're charging somebody £1,000 for something, is that worth £10,000 to them easily? Now, sometimes it's hard to judge that because it's not necessarily a monetary or measurable outcome that you're delivering. It can be an intangible outcome, and it's hard to put a number on it. But even in that scenario, if you put yourself in your customer's shoes, you, 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 can, you can kind of weigh it and go, well, you know, if you can give me that outcome, that's easily worth 10 times what I'm paying for it. You know, the magnitude, the impact of achieving that outcome or that result is easily worth 10 times what I'm paying for it. And that's, to me, that, that's kind of the benchmark. I think, right, is it worth 10 times more, at least? Okay, ideally 20 times, 100 times. You know, if you can get into, you can get into that realm, you're into the kind of, that is an irresistible no-brainer offer. You know, people are gonna take you up on that offer. So, so these are the factors. When, you, when you're putting an offer together, when I, if I work with someone and we're looking at structuring an offer, these are the kind of things that we look at to try and you know, package that offer as, as effectively as we can. So, key takeaways. I'll just, I'll just quickly rattle through these so we sort of finish on time. Um, so customers want outcomes, okay? Not products per se. Value is created by helping them achieve those outcomes, okay? So think of in those terms. Sales is about trust and momentum. It's not really about persuasion. Choose your customers wisely for all the reasons we talked about. It just makes life so much easier. It makes your value so much more powerful. Don't ignore perceived risk. That's the one that will kill a lot of sales. Your promise, your promise you know, at the beginning of that framework, that's the foundation of your customer value. Your promise drives everything else that you do. Your messaging is really, I called it a value path, okay? And, and the Uber model, understanding, belief, excitement, receptive, it's a value path. You, you, your messaging and, and the whole journey you take your customers on, you should be adding value at every point, as much as you can, within the context of what you do. And we said at the beginning, you know, be radically helpful, I think that's the, Rob, the Robin Sharma quote, but that's it, really, that, that's the essence of, of, of taking people on a journey, is, is add value, move them forward at every step of the way, if you can. And, you know, your, your offer, that, that, that kind of final piece is, is an outcome accelerator. What you're saying to your customer is, right, I've proven to you that I can help you. I think I've convinced you I can get you this outcome you need. Are you ready to do it? Because the next step is become a customer. And now we really put, you know, pedal to the metal because it's our product and our service around it that's going to get you there. So it, it just accelerates the outcome that your customer wants. And I would say, you know, in my view, sales success is it's about value acceleration. It's understanding what value is first and foremost, and then aligning everything you do to accelerate that value. That's, that's what sales really is. You know, the, the, the successful salespeople I've met and successful sales organizations, they're just really good at that. They understand what value is and they know how to accelerate it. Okay, that's, that's me done. So that that's the sort of the, the core of what I wanted to go through today. Um, I can't remember, did we, did we hit the two things you wanted to? Um, but no, but probably just because of time, okay. you know. Um, I think I have, from your initial slides, I've definitely updated my own deck about how we describe the value of what we bring in, because we were actually obsessed with ourselves. Yeah. So when you were speaking, I was actually updating some slides to say, well, you know, changing the text so it's being obsessed with the result for the customer. Yeah. So that was massively helpful at the beginning. Yeah. Um, probably didn't cover the upsell bit. In terms of the structure of a sales cycle, probably not, but if I go back to your canvas and get some structure about messaging, then I guess I've got something repeatable just to carry on using, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. So, so, the, um, so yeah, the, the, the upsell thing, so where I think, uh, I, forgive me because I was going to mention it and I forgot. So the upsell thing, I think where that comes into play is when you start thinking in terms of outcomes, 
it should naturally prompt you to talk about upsells because ultimately your upsell helps people get to that outcome. So if you're focused, if you, if you in your own mind are thinking, how do I get my customer this outcome that they really want? It, it, it should naturally follow that you'll say, well, I've, I've got this as kind of an entry point, but if I'm focused on giving them that value and accelerating that value, you, you know, you upsell them to B and C because B and C will accelerate value or deliver more value. I think we made a mistake when we built the product because we were obsessed with it being self-serve and because it's self-serve, we've lost that ability to upsell because we don't have regular contact anymore. So what it's done is it's enabled us to sell, move on, sell, move on. Right. But because we haven't built in anything for <laughs> You can, easily add, you can easily add that back in though, can't you? Just as a, a monthly call to the customer. Need to do or... something, yeah. Definitely need to do something. Yeah. But more features to actually upsell as well, right? Yeah. Because yeah. what we've said is you can have everything for this per person per month. There's only little bits really, and I'm like, we need to we need to give we need to create some features in the product that are actually worth upselling to. Well, Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, but if you just actually if you just talk to the customer on a monthly basis just as a touch base, they'll tell you what they want. Yeah. Point. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That that is the way to do it. Have the conversation with with your kind of your best customers, the yeah. ones that you know you, mm. you 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 do well with, and you're adding real value to, and then say to them, right, what else? Can what we else do? do we need to yeah. do? Yeah. You, you might you might already have it. Yeah, so. yeah. Because once you figure out what they need, it's then very easy to offer that to to other existing customers. You know, because you say, right, okay, <coughs> you yeah, you could email them or. I mean, there's even way, depending on what your product is, you can even introduce it in, into your product where when they access a certain feature, it pops up something that says, yeah, by the way, yeah. we've introduced a new module or whatever, you know, there's, there's ways of doing it. So, so, you know, this is why I think it's so powerful to think in terms of outcomes because when you really think about getting your customer an outcome, you start to think of different ways of adding value and you can ask them and get their opinion and they will make your product more valuable. Okay, they, they will help you build a more valuable product. We'll definitely we'll need to focus on that stuff. Definitely yeah. need to do it. Just think about the outcome, um, and that will naturally lead to creating more value and an upsell path. Um, so that yeah, that so that's what I wanted. The point I wanted to make on that. Um, and yeah, in, in terms of like sales process, this is the challenge. Obviously, when we do a workshop like this, because we've got different types of business, it's hard to get into the more into the weeds of a, of a specific tactical plan, yeah. i.e. how do we go and do X, Y, and Z, because it's gonna be different, a slightly different for everybody. Um, but hopefully the framework will get you thinking about that um, in, in terms of, you know, who's that audience, where are they, how do you reach them, what, what are the steps you need to lead them through, and then, you know, then, then that starts to inform you you know, where are they, where do they hang out, for starters. And that in itself, that, that will guide you in terms of the how, the how you actually reach out to them um, and, and the actual process. So, you know, that, that, that will help. I mean, that, that's, you know, if I coach clients, that's where we use the framework as a, well, as a framework, as, as a guide, as a guideline framework. And then that just helps us drill off into getting down into the tactics and the specifics of what they need to do and how they need to do it. So yeah, so sorry we couldn't really hey, get into fine. that, but yeah. yeah.